So how does a computer draw? Well, we can break down the difficult problem of trying to have a computer draw anything into just having it draw a series of triangles and being clever about how we color them. Of course, this is a bit of an oversimplification, but not by as much as you may think. So let's start by solving how to draw a single triangle. A triangle can be defined by three vertices, one for each corner. In a simple two-dimensional coordinate system, the position of each vertex can be represented with two numbers, an x and a y coordinate. So we have our six values as an input, and as an output we want an image that represents our triangle. Therefore, all we need to do is find out what pixels are mostly contained by our triangle, and set each one to a color. This is exactly what the graphics pipeline in Vulkan solves for us. The graphics pipeline is a linear sequence of stages, where each stage takes as input some data, performs some operations on it, and outputs the transformed data as input into the next stage. We can think of our graphics pipeline like a factory assembly line, and at each stage our raw data is refined into something closer to resembling our final image. The first stage is the input assembler, which takes as input a list of numbers and groups them together into geometry. For our triangle example, the first six numbers may be used to form the first triangle, and the next six a second triangle, and so on. Next, the vertex shader processes each vertex individually and performs transformations such as rotations and translations. The rasterization stage breaks up our geometry into fragments for each pixel our triangle overlaps. The fragment shader processes each fragment individually and outputs values such as the color by using interpolated data from things like textures, normals, and lighting. And finally, the color blending stage applies operations to mix the values from multiple fragments that correspond to the same pixel in the final image. This is a simplified overview of the graphics pipeline, and don't worry if you're having trouble understanding what each stage does right now, as we'll go into much more detail in the coming tutorials. This is just to give you a high level overview of how things work so that you're able to keep the bigger picture in mind. There are two types of stages, fixed function and programmable. The input assembler, rasterization, and color blending stages are all fixed function. As programmers, we have less control over what operations these stages perform. We can configure each stage by setting variables that modify the stage's behavior. For the programmable stages, we have the ability to upload our own code to be executed by the GPU. These little programs that live on the GPU are called shaders and can be written in a C-like language called GLSL. In this video, we will code a basic vertex and fragment shader to draw our first triangle. Note that in this diagram, I am not showing the tessellation or geometry shader stages. These stages are programmable and occur between the vertex shader and the rasterization stage. But for our purposes, we do not need to use this functionality anytime soon. Now, one thing you may be wondering is why is all of this necessary? Wouldn't it be simpler to code a program in C++ that draws a triangle for us? And you'd be right, it would be simpler, but it would be much, much slower. What GPUs are specifically made for is doing parallel computing. So unlike a CPU, which would have to process one vertex at a time, modern GPUs are capable of processing thousands of vertices concurrently. Even top of the line multi-core CPUs cannot come close to that processing power. But for all this power, there's a trade-off. When programming for GPUs, we are much more limited in what we can do. And we can't write code for them the same way we would write for a CPU since the hardware is fundamentally different. And that's why we need to work within the constructs of the predefined graphics pipeline. So now let's get started. We're going to create our first vertex shader and fragment shader. I'm going to create a folder called shaders. And in this folder, add a file simple underscore shader.vert. The first thing we need to do is specify which version of GLSL we are using. We do this with hashtag version 450. This corresponds to GLSL version 4.5. Next, we need a main function. 
This main function is going to be executed once for each vertex we have. So thinking back to our graphics pipeline, as input, our vertex shader will get each vertex from the input assembler stage and then needs to output a position. Rather than doing this in the return value of our main function, there's a special variable called gl underscore position that we assign a value to act as our output. Notice the capital P here as well. That can be a common mistake. This is a four dimensional vector that maps to our output frame buffer image. The top left corner corresponds to negative one, negative one, and the bottom right to one, one. So this means that the center is at zero, zero. If you have used OpenGL before, take notice that the sign of the Y coordinates is flipped. Next, let's hard code vertices for our triangle. Vec2 is a built-in type in the GLSL lang that contains two floating point values. We're going to initialize a positions array of length three, one for each corner of the triangle. Use whatever values you would like that are in the range negative one to one. We need to add in three vec2s to initialize this properly. I'll be using 0, 0, negative 0 0.5. Let's copy this and do two more. Our second vertex will be 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And our final vertex will be negative 0 0.5, 0 0.5. These six values will end up looking something like this. Hard coding your values in a vertex shader isn't something you typically do. Usually we pass in our values using a vertex buffer, but for now it's all right. Finally, let's assign GL position a value. It's a vec4. And our X and Y comes from our positions array. And we can index into it with the built-in GL underscore vertex index variable, which contains the index of the current vertex for each time our main function is run. The third component is the Z value, which ranges from zero to one. And if you're familiar with digital art programs, this is kind of like having a layer with z equals zero being the frontmost layer. Now the reason for a fourth component is that in subsequent graphics pipeline stages, the GL position value is turned into a normalized device coordinate by dividing the whole vector list by its last component. So in this case, we divide everything by 1.0, i.e. nothing changes for now, but I'll cover why this can be useful at a later time. So now let's create a simple underscore shader dot frag file for our fragment shader. Same as before, we start with hashtag version 450 and also have a void main function. Unlike the vertex shader, there isn't a built-in output variable, so we need to declare it ourselves. We do so with layout bracket location equals zero, closing bracket out, vec4, and then our variable name, which in this case we'll just call something like out color. Okay, let's break this down. First, we have the layout qualifier, which takes a location value. Based on how we set up the graphics pipeline, a fragment shader is capable of outputting to multiple different locations. For now, we're only using location zero. Next, we specify that this variable is to be used as an output with the out qualifier. And finally, we declare the variable's name and what type it is. Then, in our main function, we need to assign this variable a value. So out color equals, we're using a four component vector with each component being the red, green, blue, and alpha channels in that order. The value of each component needs to be in the zero to one range. So in this case, I have red at max value, no green, no blue, and alpha at one to be fully opaque. Now don't get confused and think this means we're painting the entire image red. The fragment shader runs on a per fragment basis, which are determined by what pixels our geometry mostly contains during the rasterization stage. 
Similar to how C++ code needs to be compiled before being executed, we need to compile our shader code into an intermediate binary format known as Standard Portable Intermediate Representation 5. You've actually already downloaded this compiler when you downloaded the Vulkan SDK. How you will do this will differ based on if you're working on Windows, Linux, or Mac. For Mac OS and Linux, navigate to where you installed the Vulkan SDK and locate the file glslc and copy the file path to this program. For Linux, it will likely be in the subdirectory of Vulkan version number slash x8664 slash bin. And on Mac OS, it will likely be in the Vulkan SDK slash Mac OS slash bin folder. Okay, so once you've copied the file path to the glsl compiler, create a new bash scripting file, compile.sh in your main directory. Then paste the path you just copied. Make sure you have glslc at the end of your path. The first argument is the file path to our shader. So shaders slash simple underscore shader dot vert. Then dash o to specify our compiled output file's name. In this case, we use the same name and then add dot spv file extension at the end. Then copy this entire line and change the dot vert file extension to dot frag. Save this file, and then in terminal in your main directory, so same directory as your compile script, run chmod plus x compile.sh. This modifies the compile script to be executable. Then finally run the script, and now in your shaders directory, you should be able to see compiled shader code. On a Mac, you may get an error that this program cannot be trusted. The easiest way I found to get the compiler working is to install it separately using Homebrew. Homebrew can be found at the following link. After installing it, run brew install glslang. Use the command where glslc to get the path to the compiler. Copy and use this path instead. For Windows, open File Explorer and navigate to the directory you installed the Vulkan SDK. Then open the folder for your version number then bin32 and locate the glslc file. If you hold shift and right click, you should see an option to copy as path. Once you have the file path copied, create a new file, compile.bat in your main directory. Then paste the path you just copied and remove the quotations. The first argument is the file path to our shader. So shaders backslash simple underscore shader dot vert then dash o to specify our compiled outputs file name. In this case, use the same name and add the .spv file extension. Then copy this entire line and change the .vert file extension to .frag. Then add pause as the final line so we will be able to view the output after running. Save this file and then in your file explorer, double click your compile.bat file. In your shader folder, you should now see two more files with the .spv extensions. This is our compiled shader code. So now that we have compiled shader code, we need to read these files into our program. We're going to start by creating a new header file, lve underscore pipeline .hpp. Add a header guard and your namespace. We're going to have a new class, LVE pipeline. And in this class, a public constructor. And it's going to take a const string ref to our vertex file path. Similarly, copy this and paste it because we'll have a second parameter which goes to our fragment file path. And also, don't forget to include string. Next, declare two private functions. The first is going to be a static function that returns a vector of characters called read file. And this is going to take a const string ref to a file path, like in our constructors. We also need to include vector.
And then our second function is going to be a helper function, void create graphics pipeline. And it's going to take the exact same arguments as our constructor. All right, now let's add an implementation for our pipeline. Add a new file lve underscore pipeline dot cpp. Include our pipeline header and add your namespace. Now in your header file, grab the read file function signature and paste that in. Remove static and add your class name before your function name. Okay, so to read our shader files, we're going to use an input file stream object. So from the standard library, include fstream. Then let's initialize a new input file stream variable. So std if stream file, then put your file path as the first argument. And as the second argument, we are going to put some bit flags, std ios, eight and std ios binary. The first bit flag eight means that when the files open, we seek to the end immediately. This makes getting the size a bit more convenient. And we read it in as a binary to avoid any unwanted text transformations from occurring. Next, let's check that the file was successfully opened. So if not file dot is open, then in this case, if we fail to open the file, we'll just throw an error. Include std accept, and then throw a runtime error. Failed to open file plus file path. If you are getting this error, it's most likely because your file path is incorrect or you don't have permissions to open that file. So now we need the size of the file. So size t file size equals static cast size t file dot tell g. So because of the eight bit flag, we're already at the end of the file. So when we use tell g, we get the last position, which is the file size. Next, create a vector of characters. This is our character buffer, and we're going to initialize with the size of the file. The next thing is to seek to the start of the file because now we actually want to read the data and to read this data into our buffer.data, and the number of bytes we read is equal to file size. Now close your file with file.close and return your buffer. So that's going to be our read file function. Next, let's implement our create graphics pipeline. Similarly, let's go back to our header and grab our create graphics pipeline function signature. Add your class name. So now inside this function, all we're going to do is read in our vertex and fragment code. We're not going to do anything with it until the next tutorial, but just to make sure our read file function is working correctly, let's output the size of our vertex shader code to our console. Duplicate this line and do the same for fragment shader. And I need to also include IO stream. Now the last function to implement is our constructor. Go back to our header to grab our function signature and paste it. Add LVE pipeline. And all this is going to do is call our create graphics pipeline helper function and pass through our parameters. Now, finally, let's instantiate an instance of our LVE pipeline. So back in our first app header under window, well, first include LVE pipeline.hpp. Then under window, LVE pipeline, LVE pipeline, and pass the file paths to our vertex and fragment shaders. So this file path is relative to wherever our executable file ends up. So when I make my code in my main directory is where a dot out ends up. So our file path will be shaders slash simple underscore shader dot vert. And we can copy this and change the file extension to frag. So a common mistake, don't forget we want to read in our compiled code, not our original code. So make sure to add the .spv file extension to the file paths. 
So save and compile. And in our console, we can see vertex shader code size, 1164 characters, which sounds about right. And fragment shader code size, 424 characters. Perfect. Okay, so I think this is where we're going to leave things for now. We're about halfway to seeing our first triangle on screen. Thank you for watching. If you're enjoying this series so far, please like and subscribe. It really means a lot. Bye for now.